my beautiful and intellectually curious love bugs, today we are going to be talking all about the spotted lanternfly, hence today's look. I would like to give a huge shout out to my friend Jamie Kopko. He works in the State Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania where the lanternfly was first found and works in the Outreach and Education Department. So as I'm living in Ecuador, when I'm doing research or talking about invasives in the United States, all I got is the internet. You know, I do what I can, I talk to the people I can. So it was really helpful for Jamie to fill in a couple of the holes in my outline and, you know, just clear up a couple details for me. So I just wanted to give a huge, huge shout out and thank you to him because, you know, his boots are on the ground there and he knows what's going on better than I do. Hello, my beautiful bugs. This is editing Nancy here. So when I was going through the video last night, I realized that it was about to be like a 40 minute video about everything you could have possibly wanted to know about the lead flies because I'm answering your questions about them. And all of you on Instagram and Twitter basically said that you would rather two shorter videos rather than one longer video. So today's video is going to be a summary of the problem. What lantern flies are, how they got here, how they're spreading, what they're doing, the problems, what they're eating, all that stuff, kind of like natural history and their spread in the United States. Next video is going to be all about our possible solutions, biocontrol, natural predators, and that kind of stuff. So without further ado, let's keep going with today's video. First of all, we need to get through what even are spotted lantern flies. I ran a poll on my Twitter and on my YouTube and many of you love bugs wrote like, what even are they? You didn't know they were a problem because you didn't even know what they were or that they existed. So let's talk about what they are. A few people have noticed that they look superficially very similar to cicadas and we're asking if they're related and they are actually pretty closely related being in the same order. Both spotted lanternflies and cicadas are insects, and they are both in the order Hemiptera, which includes the true bugs, plant hoppers, cicadas, hoppers in general, aphids, white flies. If you are interested in learning about the intricacies of hemipterans and what true bugs are, et cetera, et cetera, you can check this video right up there. But basically, hemipterans have a specialized proboscis called a hemipteran beak, which is used to drink plant sap, blood, or insect fluids. Pretty generally, there are a few exceptions, but you know. Both cicadas and the spotted lanternflies have that hemipteran beak, so they are both hemipterans. And they are both in the same suborder, which is the Ocanorinca, which means that it looks like that beak is coming out of their neck versus the front of their head or their sternum like some other insects. After that, they are broken down into two separate superfamilies. The cicadas are in their own superfamily and include other things like tree hoppers and sharpshooters. And then the plant hoppers are pretty generally lumped under their own superfamily and uh, there's a lot of them. We are specifically going to be talking about the family under that super family, the Fulgorids, which is what this lanternfly is. This lanternfly is in the family Fulgoridae. Hello and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nancy. I'm an entomologist, which means that I study insects, and I live in Quito, Ecuador, where normally I'm doing jungle tours showing you all the beautiful insects and all the beautiful animals that live in the Amazon and in the cloud forest and in the Paramo of Ecuador. So if that is interesting to you, feel free to uh, check out my website in the reference section below and come visit me in Ecuador. All right, now back to the video. What do they look like? Well, they have a few different life stages. They have the nymphal stages where the wings haven't grown in yet. They have the adult stage, just the adult with all the wings and the reproductive systems and all that, and they have the egg stage. The adults are this really pretty kind of gray color with black dots on them, and their hind wings are red, and they have a pair of really strong jumping legs, so they can both jump and fly. The nymphs, depending on the stage that the nymph is at, is either going to be completely black with white spots or red and black with white spots, and you see the wings starting to slowly grow in, and the egg masses can be very, very variable. The females lay the egg masses and there's a secretion on top which can make it look like mud, but sometimes that secretion breaks or chips off or cracks in certain areas and sometimes it's 
been completely removed. It's important to note that the eggs are completely viable and can still hatch regardless if that covering is there or not, which is part of the problem. All right, great, that's what it looks like. Where is it from? It is from Asia, notably China, India, Taiwan, and Vietnam. That is its native range, and it's important to note that it is not a pest in its native range. It can also be found in South Korea, where it is non-native, and a lot of research about how it acts in non-native regions comes from South Korea for that reason. So uh, thanks for being the first ones, I guess, South Korea. <laughs> You're gonna help us out a little bit. As I mentioned in my Asian Giant Hornet video a couple weeks ago, many of our invasive and non-native species come from Asia because North America's climate and the climate in Northern Asia is pretty similar. So if you are adapted to deal with winter and summer, you can pretty much deal with winter and summer wherever. All right, so that's where it's from. How did it get here? We believe that it came over on shipments from China, most likely from stone shipments, which I know doesn't make a lot of sense, but we're gonna get to it in a second. It could have also possibly come over in other shipments, including ornamental plants and wood products. The reason why it probably came in on stone shipments is because females like to lay egg masses on vertical surfaces, which, you know, a big chunk of stone is a nice vertical surface. Also, the egg masses can kind of look like mud, so they might be harder to detect on something like stone, and you're probably less likely to look on stone for bugs than you would be like, I don't know, a plant. Each egg mass can have between 30 and 50 eggs in it, and each female can lay about two egg masses in her lifetime. So each female can lay up to 100 viable eggs which is kind of a lot. So basically they came on something that we probably weren't very likely to check and also probably blended in pretty well and the females can lay a lot of eggs. So all you really needed was one egg mass to make it through and now we have a problem. That's the information specific to the spotted lanternfly, but questions that I get a lot are, how does this keep happening? Invasives usually come in in shipments internationally. A government agent called APHIS is the one that does all the monitoring, but unfortunately they're understaffed and underpaid uh, because it's not really a huge priority. It definitely could be prioritized more. It's kind of just what happens when you have a large global market and we want stuff from not here. Only about 3.7% of shipments out of the 11 million shipments per year are actually checked. That's not a lot. And only 1% of those are checked overseas. Even if every single shipment was checked, it would be really hard to make sure that 100% of this stuff came in safely. A lot of stuff would come in in ways that you wouldn't really expect it. In Georgia, we have an invasive mosquito called the tiger mosquito. It originally came in through Texas through used tire shipments because the used tire shipments collected water and mosquitoes laid their eggs in the water in the tires, right? So you're like, I'm gonna look for bugs on plants, not in like tires and rock. It's easy for stuff to slip through because a lot of people don't necessarily know what they're looking for. And that's not necessarily their fault. You need to have a huge range of knowledge or you need a lot of different experts to be checking what you're bringing in because you can have invasives, everything from like mussels and clams and other small random like marine biology stuff. I'm not a marine biologist, so you know, stuff sometimes gets in. Like different reptiles can get in, you have different fungus and mold that can get in, other various diseases, insects can get in. So there's a lot of different types of things and you need different experts to be able to look for and say, oh, hey, you should check this type of thing because if you don't, something can get in. A good example of this is that they take rattlesnakes off of plane landing gear, right? Like, did you think that was a job? <laughs> snakes on a plane, literally taking rattlesnakes off of the landing gear of planes so they don't end up in another country. So we've covered what it is, where it's native to, and how it got here. Now, where is it in the US? This is a relatively new invasive. It was first documented in Berks County in Pennsylvania in 2014. As of 2021, it has spread to all of these states. Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Ohio, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Indiana, and we found one dead one in Kansas. 
So that's where it is. Let's talk about it spread because I've had a few people mention, say, oh, I'm in Virginia or I'm here or I'm there and it was just stop spotted in my state. Is it going to spread to me? And um, yeah, probably yes, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah prob probably, to be honest. <laughs> and that is because they're really easy to spread obviously. Part of this reason is because human transport is very likely, unlike the Asian giant hornet, which I talked about last time in last video, where you need a single mated female to create a new hive. Spotted lanternflies lay egg masses on any vertical surface and can lay a lot of them. That means transport by humans is very, very likely. If you look at the quarantine map for Pennsylvania, a lot of the areas in the quarantine and a lot of areas where the spotted lanternfly is showing up is along major highways and around big cities. That indicates that humans are most likely responsible for their transport. In the quarantine area, the Pennsylvania State Department of Agriculture banned several things to even be able to be transported. Some of these include RVs, lawn mowers, outdoor furniture, and firewood. You should under no circumstances transport firewood, whether you are in the spotted lanternfly area or not. Why? Because firewood is the perfect thing for insects to live in. This is how we have a lot of problems with the emerald ash borer and the ambrosia beetles. Carrying firewood across state lines is a recipe for disaster. Please buy local firewood, burn it there, don't move it, please. That is one of the biggest ways you can help. Another thing contributing to the massive spread of the lanternflies is that they have a huge potential range. They are very temperature tolerant. There's a lot of things that they like to eat, which we'll get into. And there's a wide area in which they can actually establish and just live their best life. And it's not just the United States either. If the spotted lanternfly makes it into Europe, <laughs> Europeans, you're gonna have the same problem as us. So like try and be better about this than we are because it's coming. We thought that perhaps winter would have been a problem for them. But again, Asia has snow and winter and stuff. Scientists looked at some temperature thresholds for the spotted lanternfly to see if maybe the cold would kill them. And these studies came out of South Korea where they're already dealing with them. It's important to note that the spotted lanternfly overwinters in the egg stage. We have found that the eggs will still hatch anywhere in between the temperatures of 9 degrees Fahrenheit to 26 degrees Fahrenheit, which you know is winter. <laughs> temperatures as low as 5 degrees Fahrenheit still has some hatching, and that's the information that came out of South Korea. However, we are finding that in Pennsylvania, where temperatures get even lower than that, obviously they're still here and they're still hatching in the spring. So maybe they can handle even lower temperatures or maybe they're finding good spots to put their eggs like that are a little bit more protected, maybe under leaf litter, maybe a little bit more insulated. So the cold winter temperatures maybe aren't affecting them as much as we think that they should or would have. So basically they can handle the cold. When you combine all these things together, a large potential range, easy for them to transport a ton of eggs and being resistant to cold temperatures, it makes their spread a little bit inevitable. Let's get on to what they eat. I had a lot of questions about their host plants and now what they have started eating here in the United States. They are a generalist. So much of our invasive species are generalists. They can eat a lot of different things. They can survive in a wide variety of habitats. That's what makes them the problem. They feed on woody and non-woody plants. And in their native country, they would be eating the tree of heaven. Uh, it is now also an invasive species in North America. The tree of heaven came here first. <laughs> So not only did we bring over this invasive insect, we also have had the invasive plant that it feeds on for quite some time. The tree of heaven goes by a bunch of other different common names, including varnish tree, the stinking sumac, apparently it smells bad, and the Chinese sumac. That is what the spotted lanternfly likes to complete its life cycle on. That is the preferred host. There is testing being done currently to see if the spotted lanternfly can complete its life cycle on any of the other 
trees that are found natively in North America. Just because it needs to complete its life cycle on the tree of heaven doesn't mean that it can't eat other things. Actually, it can eat a lot of other things. Up to 70 to 100 other species of plants is perfectly edible to this insect, and 20 new associations have been made since it's made its way into North America. When we're looking at the agricultural sector, it likes to eat a bunch of things like grape vines and hops. So if you like alcohol, that's not a great thing. It eats a bunch of fruiting trees, so a lot of orchard farmers are concerned about it. And it likes to eat plants in the family Rosaceae, including stone fruits. It eats at least 12 ornamental plants, including the Virginia creeper, the Amur cork tree, and the Chinese mahogany. It also feeds on a bunch of forest trees, including pine trees, willow trees, maple trees, birch trees, and walnut trees, to name a few. Right now in Pennsylvania, farmers are particularly particularly worried about Christmas trees and grape vines. So if you like Christmas and wine, again, you so what even is the big deal? Especially I'm sure some of you are thinking that like, I didn't even know what this thing was. Like, why is it even a big deal? It's important to note that the spotted lanternfly is not killing the plants outright. What happens when you have a high level of insects and a high level of infestation is that you get a lot of damage to the tree, which makes it more susceptible to disease and fungus and other insects coming to take a stab at it. Also, the spotted lanternfly is a hemipteran. It drinks plant sugary sap, so there's not a lot of other minerals and nutrients in it. So basically to compensate is that they're just always sucking plant sap, which means the plant sap goes in and effectively out in the same form. Sugar goes in, sugar comes out. This is called honeydew rain, which is a very fancy name for insecty, liquidy, sugary poop falling on you. And I have stood under trees with plenty of fulgurids or other plant hoppers on them, and you can feel like the honeydew raindrops hit your face. And you're like, oh great, this came out of the butt of an insect, perfect. When you have a lot of these plant hoppers all pooping out high levels of sugar at the same time, then you get a huge attraction of other pest insects, including ants and wasps. It's unclear if this is enough sugar and sap to increase populations of wasps and ants, but it's definitely enough to attract the ones that already are there. So if you have one of these trees that's infested in your backyard, uh, I hope you like wasps and ants because they're coming too. We're looking at huge damages, mainly in the agricultural sector. So if we look at the agricultural sector, this is including both lumber and like crops and stuff. Together in the quarantine zone, we're looking at a approximately $50 million lost per year, with a worst case scenario of $93 million lost per year and anywhere between 500 and 1,000 jobs lost per year. As statewide, we're looking at about $334 million lost annually and about 2,800 jobs, with a worst case scenario of about $554 million lost per year and up to 5,000 jobs. That's kind of like ag in general. But if we break it down a little bit more to like ag kind of crops, what we're looking at is about $8 million lost per year in the quarantine zone about $23 million lost statewide with grape trees, Christmas trees, and fruit trees being the most affected. Now we're going to talk a little bit about forest products like timber and lumber and stuff like that. We're looking at a loss of about $16.7 million lost in the quarantine zone, about $152 million lost statewide, and with a worst case scenario of about $236 million lost annually statewide. So uh, that's a lot of jobs and that's a lot of money to be losing. What about forest ecosystems? We know that the spotted lanternfly is not directly killing the trees, which is a better scenario than the ambrosia beetles and the emerald ash borers. When we're looking at this, we're looking more at what damage it's causing economically because we don't think it's causing a huge, huge problem to our native forests. It's going to damage your ornamental plants in your garden, so that's not great, <laughs> but it is not going 
to, at least for now, we believe is not going to be destroying our forests. So a lot of research hasn't been done yet. Most of the research is being done on how to control it in agricultural settings. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the how can we fix it solution. It is important to note that they do respond well to pesticides. And so it's not like these spotted lanternflies are going to be destroying the crops. It's that they are going to be significantly increasing the, the price of maintaining and keeping those crops healthy, which means ultimately you will see that at the grocery store with higher prices. Well, my love bugs, I hope that you liked today's video and that you are excited for part two when we talk about some of the possible solutions and biocontrol options. If you want to keep watching my channel, feel free to click around here. There's suggestions made by me and the YouTube algorithm and don't forget to like and subscribe.